כן. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for this day, Master. We come to you, Lord. <coughs> Master, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that you've made a way for us to come to your very presence, Lord. And Father, we thank you for the reassurance. We thank you for the, Lord, the peace, Lord, that you fill us with. We thank you for the freedom that we have in you, Master. We thank you, Lord, for, for the hope that we receive from you, Father God. We thank you for the strength that we receive from you, Lord. We thank you, Father God, for all this is, uh, Lord, you are the source of all this, Father God. We thank you. And even this morning, Lord, we, we come to you, Lord, with that faith and expectation, Lord, that, um, that you would speak to us, Master, that you would write your word upon our hearts, God, that your presence will make a difference in each one of our lives, Father God. We thank you. Open our eyes, Lord, to see you. Open our ears to hear you, Father God. And Lord, our hearts are expectant, O oh God, even as we look into your word, Master, we pray that you would write your word upon our hearts, Master. We thank you. We bless your name. We give you all the praise and all the glory at this time. In Jesus' master's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So um, last class we looked at uh, chapter 7, right? Um, Uh, we looked at chapter 7, uh, 1 Corinthians, and then uh, um, where Paul is talking about this whole issue of marriage, divorce, um, remarriage, and also about uh, being single, right? So we looked at all that. Um, and also we, uh, you know, when we studied that, we see that Paul is uh, very clear about uh, making a distinction between what he says and also um, what... Uh, God says, right? What what is a command, and what is His opinion, or b based on His experience, right? His wisdom. So He He talks about that, right? Um, and so, um, uh, so let's let's look at. Um, I think there were a couple of questions about the the grounds for marriage, uh, ground for divorce. Sorry. Um, let me just uh, share the screen. Um, okay, so there were some questions about um, okay, so some of the grounds for divorce, and then we we looked at that. We looked at unfaithfulness. We looked at uh, you know willful desertion. Desertion, sorry, um, if someone abandons uh, the person and uh, you know goes off, and then they don't hear from that person and so these are some grounds for, uh, you know, for divorce, separate, legal separation, and which means when there is a biblical ground for, when we say biblical ground, you know, biblical reason for a divorce, <clears throat> then that's a biblical reason for a remarriage as well. <clears throat> okay, now. The thing is that if if the couple separates or divorces, then uh, for any other reason, for any other reason than what is biblically permitted, right? Maybe um, you know whatever you know, then it is better that they remain unmarried or reconciled. Okay, so God's heart is definitely for reconciliation. Or restoration. However, we know that you know every situation is different, and every situation is complex. So, if there is a you know biblical reason for divorce, right? What we see, what we see in scripture, then that is the biblical reason for remarriage as well. Okay. So, um, okay. So, let's look at uh, verse fourteen. 1 Corinthians verse 14, he, he talks about um, a situation where the, so this is, a, this is a typical situation where the couple is married and uh, the husband or the wife is an unbeliever, okay? So one of them becomes a believer, but this is in the marriage scenario, 
right in the within the marriage so they are already married and then one of them becomes a believer so there in verse 14 it says uh, uh, or let's be, read before that um verse 12 but to the rest not i I, not the Lord, say, if a brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. Right. So he's, uh, he's saying he, he, here again, he's talking about his wisdom. He's talk, talking based on you know his wisdom and experience with the Lord, talking um, his walk journey with the Lord. And uh, it's his recommendation, not a specific command or word from the Lord. Okay, so um, so one thing is that we see that God's heart is, you know, even in that situation also, you know, if they are willing. Now it's a it's a difficult marriage. Why is it a difficult marriage? Because one person is believing, the other person is not. Right. So there is there seems to be pulling in two different directions. <clears throat> right. But if they are willing to stay together, he's saying, let it not be a reason for separation. Okay, so that we need to be very clear. So this is already one person is already married. Okay, so we we also should be careful that you don't use this particular instruction to enter into a marriage covenant with an unbeliever. Okay, so here you know Paul is saying anyway, you know. If if the, they're willing to live, if the person is an unbeliever, they're willing to you know uh, stay in that marriage, you know don't separate. But here he's he's referring to somebody who's already married. So he's so this is not an instruction or a you know a, a license for someone to consider marrying an unbeliever. Okay. So that's very clear. Okay. So Second uh, Corinthians six fourteen. Where it talks about why we should not be unequally yoked with a uh, unbeliever, you know those reasons still hold good. Okay, um, but if the unbelieving spouse, you know, wants to leave, then there is no reason to hold on. You know that is also one more thing that he says. Right, verse fourteen: For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. So, in a way, what Paul is saying is that because of the believer in the house, okay, there is a setting apart unto the Lord of the other person also. Right? That doesn't mean that the other person is saved, right? Because we know salvation, one has to um, receive personally, individually, and one cannot do it on behalf of the other. Right? So, that is clear. So, here he's saying is sanctified set apart as unto the lord uh, there is a special grace on them maybe they are closer to being saved than they were before you know they are being exposed to the values they are exposed to the ways of god they are exposed to the word of god right so in that sense they are set apart unto the lord okay but it doesn't mean that the person is saved right okay Verse 15, but if the unbeliever departs, okay, we're looking at uh, chapter 7, verse 15. If the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. Okay, meaning, you know, if, the, if there is a willful desertion, you know, the person wants to abandon, the person wants to leave, uh, saying that, you know, I don't want anything to do with Jesus. Um, and you know your way of life, and I'm I'm leaving. I need to go. The priority is to actually restore, to reconcile. He says, but God has called us to peace. But he also says that if they want to go, then the other believer, you know, the believer in the marriage is not bound in such cases. Bound in the sense is not a legally bound um, to that marriage in it, in such cases, right? And also verse 16, <clears throat> a wife, whether you will, you know, how do you know a wife, whether you will save your husband, or how do you know a husband, whether you will save your wife, in the sense that through you, through your witness, the other person coming to the Lord, right? So so that is the thing, but it, salvation does not happen as a result of 
you know, one person being a believer, the other person being an unbeliever. And uh, because the, the scripture says that one person is set apart unto the Lord, right? Um, so, so that's very, very, very clear, right? Um, yeah. Okay, then there was another another question, I think, uh, by Chaya uh, last class about what about verbal abuse? What about, uh, you know, uh, that kind of a mental abuse, right? So there again, the same principle uh, is applies, you know, where <clears throat> if there is a momentary separation so that this uh, issue can be addressed, right? Where um, this issue, this problem, this challenge of verbal abuse, uh, this damage that is done to another person because of continued, you know, mental torture or abuse in any way. So the thing is to have a, uh, have a time of separation and so that this issue, this challenge can be addressed biblically with the person who's the perpetrator of the crime, right? And also the victim of this whole thing, the recipient of this abuse, um, so that the person can be saved, uh, as in um, protected right, from further abuse. And there can be a solution. Right? There can be a restoration where the problem can be addressed. But if this continues, goes on and on and on. So that is the issue, right? If the if there's a uh, you know mental abuse that is that is going on and on, which means that that person is not holding on to the covenant of marriage, right? Is abusing, violating the marriage covenant. Where Ephesians five is very clear: the husband is supposed to, you know. Uh, as Christ loved the church, <clears throat> so the the husband is expected to love the wife, and as um, the wife is expected to be, you know, to honor and, and and be in submission, and in fact both are supposed to be in submission to each other and so on. So it, it's a clear violation and an abuse of the covenant of marriage, right? So in such cases, like one has to make a decision whether it needs to be continued or you know every every attempt has to be made in order to restore right um so that is the uh, you know that is but but if it if it just continues then it is legal ground ground again for separation right okay so let's um, let's move on um yeah let's move on to um, uh, chapter uh, 7 verse 17 okay but as god has distributed each one as the lord has called each one so let him walk and so i ordain in all the churches was anyone called while circumcised let it not become uncircumcised was anyone called while uncircumcised let it not let him not be circumcised circumcision is nothing uncircumcision is nothing but keeping the commandments of god is what matters so let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can be made free, rather use it. But he who is called uh, in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, that each one remain with God in that state in which he was called okay so he's uh, talking about uh, 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 one he, he, he's talking about various things that a person uh, the status or the season of life of a person could be single separated wherever um, so he's saying you know you honor god <clears throat> in that season so he's saying uh, as god has called each one so let him walk he's talking about journeying with the lord and so um, God has given, God has uh, graced everyone, God has called everyone. So he's saying you be, learn to remain with God or learn to honor God, learn to walk with God in that present situation, in that present station or uh, uh, phase of life. Right? Um, so he's, he's talking about uh, a, a culture where there were bond servants. Right, where they were slaves, where they were bond servants, uh, was working for households. Right, so he's he's talking about addressing that kind of a scenario also, where 
okay if you were called while you were a bond servant while you were a slave uh, if you can be free make use of it right but continue to serve the lord okay so which is a high calling he's saying okay you were you, were, you, know, you know your rights you were born as a you know you were uh, uh, you were you have a question okay. about oh about, okay <clears throat> about the previous thing what we were looking at okay so like pastor there's any kind of we can say like call to not get married sorry sorry what what any some people says my calling is not get married be single to be single yeah is it like uh, that there's calling for being single no no is there a calling for somebody to be not get married be sing, being yeah single. so that's what paul addresses no in one uh, paul saying the same thing he's saying you know i i wish you could be as i am but he is also saying that yes uh, it could singleness could be a gift to be celibate to be single could be a gift see he's saying uh, when he says uh, for example, let's look at it um which verse does he talk about um, about singleness did we look at uh, the previous chapter is it uh, seven only Mm. Yeah, so verse seven. I wish that all men were even as I am, but each one has his own gift from God. One in this manner, and another in that. And uh, yeah, so it's a okay. Uh, it's a gift from God. It's a which means it's a charis, right? That's what word is he, which he uses, which is a grace from God, which is a ability, right? So maybe self control and whatever. that's an ability that god has given them so he's saying okay if one has that you walk in it so when you say calling saying specifically okay god is saying to that person i want you to be like this right i want you to remain right that's what that's your question right yeah so like so after specific. hearing this like i i thought in my mind like if this is calling from god and why god created women right so uh so paul you know the general design or general will of god is that people should you know this is what god has designed right marriage and family and 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 all that so this is what god has created but we also see that for certain people maybe it's the call of god but you know we can't use it generally we can we need to be kind of careful in it we can't assume it maybe god has called that person and graced that person to live a single life it's possible but when one needs to be sure yeah so we can say like this is grace to yeah. them it's not kind of calling to be a single but so, yeah but why does he give the grace see unless he is like uh, uh just asking okay it works two ways one one is maybe um, it could even be the desire of that person which god will honor right if it says if they suppose you because god has given us free will and if that person decides for whatever reason saying that i want to serve god and i want to serve god in this manner so that you know i'll be free of other responsibilities or whatever distractions whatever you know i'm able to devote my time focus and do this so if that is the case right god will honor that god will honor that yeah so after hearing that like uh, the thought came to me god give us free will so if i like uh, if someone if they deciding that not to get married god will honor that honor that but it's uh, not from god or like pastor like it's his decision is talking like i will be like this and i will serve god like this yeah. and god will bless or god, god yes. will bless but it is not god will do for that right uh, but, but god what, will honor mm, after yeah i get your point yeah god will honor that and god god will but the god but god gives the grace as well right he'll give the enabling uh, power of the holy spirit in order to do that um i'm also looking at um uh see we, when we go to second corinthians we also look at um, the same aspect of um, 
up the screen one second. Um, so this, this again, this whole aspect of um, marriage, is it Second Corinthians or is it First Corinthians itself? Um, Paul actually addresses it a little further. Um, Um, I'm sorry, I'm not able to get that reference, but um, yeah, I'll I'll share that. Yeah, I'll just share that where he uh, explains things a little further um, about uh, about marriage. <laughs> yeah, I think in in seven itself, towards the end, right, uh, concerning uh, like from twenty five onwards. Uh, verse 25 onwards, right? So he's kind of explaining um, uh, about singleness again, right? He's, he's going on to say that, uh, you know, um, if, uh, like verse 37, he who stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will, and has so determined in his heart, does well, um, he's talking about giving in marriage, and uh, and he says, you know, uh, uh, but she is happier if she remains as she is, according to my judgment. And I think I also have the spirit of God. So, yeah. So he's uh, let's we we'll, we will go into it verse by verse. <clears throat> but the final conclusion about this is that uh, he says it's it's fine. It is okay for a person to. Uh, um, you know, to be single, God gives the grace, which means He approves of it and He honors your choice. Um, but your specific question of whether God will call that person to live that way also is possible. It is possible, <laughs> but I I don't have chapter and verse. We don't have chapter and verse. But um, yeah, let's go through this and then let's uh, discuss further. Right? Okay. Um, you have a question? Uh, yeah. So, Pastor, like in First Timothy, yeah. uh, chapter three, verse two, is saying like, a bishop then must be blameless, mm -hmm. and the husband of one wife. Yeah. So it's coming to that like, uh, is this command like okay, one pastor or one leader should be must be a husband of one wife? So is it like must to marriage or keep the count like only one wife like that? I would say. Um, see, he's talking about, a, again, Ephes he's writing to um, the culture in Ephesus where probably there were even multiple, you know, multiple uh, spouses, or whatever. So he's saying, you know, you must be a hu husband of one wife. So that is, that is very clear that you can't have multiple spouses, but you need to have your one. So that's the thing. Uh, but your question is, is he talking about keeping the marriage covenant? Yeah. So keeping the marriage covenant also it goes with it, right? Honoring the marriage. But um, uh, but above that, he's saying, okay, he must be a, a person who's faithful to one and not have multiple uh, women. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, Ephesus, again, <clears throat> a similar culture and a similar society like Corinth, where uh, you know it was everything was permissible it was a very permissible culture so he's talking he's addressing that as well right. yeah okay any further questions okay okay let's uh, so let's move on uh, let's look at um, okay so we uh, we address that about the calling of God, about the season of life that people are in, and um, so saying you continue to serve God in whatever season and whatever you know season of life that you are in, right? So verse twenty five onwards, okay. So he's talking about um, people who are unmarried, right? He's he's giving, you know, I think the uh, we'll get more clarity about what Shira was asking about. Okay, so now concerning. 
<clears throat> virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord, yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. I suppose, therefore, that this is good because of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. But this I say, brethren, the time is short, so that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. Those who weep as though they did not weep, those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, and those who buy as though they did not possess, and those who use this world as not misusing it, for the form of this world is passing away. But I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the world, things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. There is a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, that how she may please her husband. But I say this for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, but for what is proper, that you may serve the Lord without distraction. So he's talking, first of all, Right? He's talking, verse 25, he's talking to the, the unmarried uh, and he's recommending something and he's saying, okay, this is from me and not from the Lord. Right? This is from me. Uh, that is what he first says. No, I have no commandment from the Lord, but I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. Okay? So um, so that, that's the, his judgment, his wisdom that he's sharing. <clears throat> and he's saying, you know, it is... It, if possible, remain as you are, you know, single or married. Uh, he's talking about the present distress which they were facing in Corinth, possible about you know, possibly persecutions against believers and so on. And and he's saying, you know, if you do get married, <clears throat> you're not doing anything wrong, but you need to face the responsibilities, the challenges, the pressures of married life, and also. Now, at that time, what they were facing, you know, persecutions, uh, etc., and from the society and so on, right? So then he goes on to say that about priorities, okay? Um, don't get engrossed with the world. Don't get, you know, as we in, we need to be, we need to fulfill our responsibilities uh, in marriage because God has designed marriage, and he's talking about that previously. Uh, but again. You make your focus, your primary focus, on the Lord. This is for both husband and wife in the in the marriage, because you know the world is passing away. So don't focus, don't prioritize the external things. Right? Don't prioritize the things that are passing away. Let your priority be on eternal things of eternal value. So you focus on you know, serving the Lord. Let your focus be on the Lord. Okay, so that is something that he says. But he also goes on to say that, you know, he goes on to bring out the difference. If you are married, it's a responsibility. There, there are, you know, there are pressures. There, is, there are challenges and you need to be able to face it. And he's saying you need to be, you know, be aware of this reality. Okay, so... Is saying that uh, I want you to be without care. Verse 32, and uh, if you are unmarried, you have your focus is priority is something. But if you are married, your focus and priority will be you know your spouse and family as well. But you keep your focus on the Lord. Verse 35, I say that this is an advice. You know, it's a, it's a, a word of wisdom. So he's saying, I say this for your own profit. Not that I may put a leash on you. Okay, so so that's the thing, right? But for what is proper and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. So he's just giving a his opinion, his wisdom, and it is not to put a leash. What does that mean? It is not to restrict the person, it's not to you know bind the person and saying, Okay, if if I you know I if I want to serve the Lord, then I have to remain single. No, he's not teaching that. Or 
is saying that you know you can only serve the lord effectively if you're not married or if you are married then you won't give the priority or focus to the lord he's not saying that at all right he's just talking about the reality of both uh, you know states both marital states right the reality of it uh, and then he's saying you know you choose right he's saying i'm, I'm not putting a leash on you but you choose okay so the thing is the the main reason is that you need to focus prioritize the lord in whatever it is if you are married if you are not married whatever marital status you are in you need to bring that have that focus to be uh, able to prioritize walking with the lord to be able to prioritize serving the lord okay so that is very clear so he is not forbidding to marry uh, in fact uh, i think first timothy chapter 4 he says that you know that uh, the spirit expressly says that uh, in latter times some will depart, depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons speaking lies and hypocrisy and one of the things you know he's talking about heresies are that uh, they will teach as a commandment that one should not marry okay verse 3 forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods etc right so so obviously um, he's not uh, you know he's not subscribing to that right so this forbidding to marry and etc is it, as a command from the lord it's it's not you know it's a her heretical teaching if um, somebody teaches that it's a heresy right so which means that this whole thing is a choice which god honors okay it's he's given free will and it's a choice that god honors and he is god is not going to in this particular area he is not going to command a person uh, so also the you know the, the the minister of god should not command or teach as a commandment that one should either be single or one should definitely be married it should not be taught as a commandment right so uh, so that paul is making it very clear about that right okay any further questions on this Uh, oh, this is something on chat. Okay. Um, will God set apart uh, someone for him and uh, some people for him and not get married? Jeremiah, Elijah, John the Baptist as reference. Now, like Paul himself, um, set apart for himself. Now that it's again a choice that you make, Prince. it's a choice that we make so that's uh, that's what paul is very clearly saying and in fact when he's addressing this itself when even when he says you know you remain as you are remain unmarried he's saying this is something that i'm saying it's not a commandment from the lord so the lord would not you know command but he would honor if you would to, if you were to make a choice like that right i mean that's what we see in scripture right uh, the extent to which we can actually go with that um, instruction this is what it's the scripture says right yeah uh, nina has a question uh are you able to hear me pastor yeah. can you hear me yes we can we can hear you okay uh, uh the um, while it is, does mention this biblical uh, grounds for divorce i mean that one particular clause that is mentioned no yeah uh, it is based yeah so if while we always keep in mind that it is never god's intention that it should happen but if it does yeah and they do go ahead with it uh -huh. um then uh, a remarriage is okay if it is on these grounds or because so many do that no so i just wanted to be clear on that yeah so so that that's the only um thing that conclusion that only inference that we can you know uh, we can conclude with is that if it is on biblical grounds uh, mm -hmm. what the bible says if it is on biblical grounds then it is uh, it is okay for people to you know marry now what happens if you know if it is uh, not on biblical grounds and yet yes. people you know remarry uh, does that mean that that covenant should not be honored or you know in the eyes of god how does it you know look so so that's a that's a tricky thing again but um, mm -hmm. but since it is a covenant um 
you know we we can actually prevent others from or, or teach others to prevent making such decisions but if a decision is made and if they are uh, you know if, if a couple is in the marriage covenant then it has to be honored by both mm-hmm. uh, uh, the one of the reasons why i asked that i mean because in the old uh, testament there is like if if the uh, i mean there is a, in this particular chapter itself there is saying yeah. i mean as far as possible a uh, husband should not divorce and a, and a, or a wife has to be reconciled yeah or and then goes on to say you remain in your situation right or be reconciled like that right. in the old testament it also talks about you know if that person whom you have divorced oh. um is still alive then that i mean they, they say it is a very convoluted thing no that you that you should not have another partner in that because it really defiles the original commandment of god no about that monogamy kind of thing so um, i mean does it uh, does it still hold good now i mean even if it is biblical grounds hmm. that the divorce has happened uh, will that still uh, be in effect because uh, because uh, mark okay matthew is the only one who gives that condition right hmm. that you can hmm. but mark says if you okay divorce and you remarry hmm. it mentions it as as adultery still yeah so the so the 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 circumstance in which the yeah. divorce happens so that yeah. that has a bearing that has on, it has that has a bearing yeah that has a bearing on whether that, yeah, yeah. That, that has a bearing on whether the remarriage is a adultery okay or, not. or not. yeah so okay. so that right. is all, always the um, yeah that's the, the parameter that, that we keep in mind i mean exactly. if it is if it is on that grounds then it is okay right right Okay. Yeah. yeah but in today's church you know you have all kinds of scenarios right we have maybe um, a remarriage that has happened now as uh, as ministers of god all we can do is to encourage that couple to honor this covenant and for doing everything possible to uh, for their marriage to thrive and flourish right so so that is the thing i just want to add that as well right so not to push people to you know take marriage lightly but to mm-hmm. honor that um i'm talking about a couple who was remarried right mm-hmm. maybe they are, both of them are from you know from divorced, divorced yeah. backgrounds right they and um, so it's like so we see that also right but the thing is to really um, um encourage uh, the couple to to can make everything possible to honor this covenant um yes uh, despite what whatever challenges mm-hmm. and also you know the thing is this they they could they shouldn't enter or continue their marriage with a sense of condemnation and same shame mm. right so that is also there right? so to, they need to have, have that confidence and the assurance that yes we have made a covenant and, and with god as witness and we are going to do everything to keep it it's not like okay you know god is uh, he's uh, he's condemned us or he is uh, he's treating us as second class believers because we made a mistake in the past we know the grace of god covers that so oh, that's for sure uh, whatever kind of uh, horrid you know uh, sin or iniquity that people were in grace of god covers that now it's a fresh start now you know you do everything uh, and to walk with god and to make sure the marriage thrives yeah so that should be the outlook right okay the, uh, uh, so one more question in yeah. case the grounds for uh, divorce is not the biblical one right. and yet they are divorced and then they again remarry so that would not be acceptable in the lord at say no that's what i'm saying you know they they have remarried you have a situation that they have remarried and the divorce was not on, on biblical grounds so so what do we do yeah huh. will, will the grace of god cover that or not Hmm. you know so so that's the that's the question so should they go through life with shame and condemnation or hmm. can they lean into the grace of god and you know make this work because if they're going to going through if they're going to go through life with shame and condemnation this this marriage is going to have all kinds of problem right hmm. so they're going to their extra baggage that they are carrying in um so 
So does the grace of God empower them to live a full life, even though they made a mistake? Uh, in this covenant, will they? Will it? Good God, you know, will God enable them? Give them the grace to live a full life? The answer is yes. So they need to leave back that baggage and go forward in this. Yeah. Which is which, where, where the grace of God covers, where the grace of God empowers them to live their full life. Right. So that is what I would say. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, so let's um, let's move forward. Okay. Okay, so he's uh, here. You know, it's uh, we we have a the the way in which these verses are written. You know, it's it's slightly difficult for us to understand. Okay, just the following verses, right, from verse thirty six onwards. Um, so let's read through. Okay, if any man thinks he is behaving improperly towards his virgin. And if she is past the flower of youth, and thus it must be, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin, let them marry. Nevertheless, he who stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity but has power over his own will, and is so determined in his heart that he will keep his virgin, does well. So then he who gives her in marriage does well, but he who does not give her in marriage does better. Verse 39 a wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives, but if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. But she is happier if she remains as she is, according to my judgment, and I think I also have the Spirit of God. Okay. So verses 36, 37, 38, you know, he's saying if any man thinks that he's behaving improperly towards his you know, a virgin, so what is he referring to here? You know? uh, is he referring to a young man, you know, who is engaged to be married, right? So two unmarried people, and he's addressing the young man who's, um, you know, who's engaged to be married, betrothed to be married, and you know, and is he addressing that? So that could be one interpretation. The other one could be uh, the father, right? Who's who has a daughter, and because he says, you know, you, you, uh, verse 38, he who gives her in marriage does well, right? So some translations, like the NIV and so on, good news, um, present it as the first scenario, right? The first scenario meaning that this is a person, this is a couple who is engaged to be married, and the young man is behaving improperly, right? Uh, so he's saying before marriage, right? So it talks about that scenario. But the second one is the second scenario, other translations like the Amplified, etc. Saying the word daughter, they introduce the word daughter, right? So making it clear that it's a father who is giving the uh, marriage, uh, may, giving the daughter in marriage. So he's talking about a scenario where uh, a father, even if he does not give his daughter in marriage, you know, she's, it's fine. Now it says this person is slightly older, you know, uh, past the marriageable age, maybe, you know, of that society. It's past the flower of youth, is what she's not a young person anymore. Right. So, uh, so that is what it means. Okay. If the father does not, you know, of course, or give her away in marriage, it's fine. Now, the King James, New King James actually present the literal, like the literal, literal text and saying, Properly towards the virgin, and just leave the interpretation for us, right? So, so this is um, so this is how it is. So, so while there is there is no error in the text, in the, in the original Greek, right, in which it was presented, but now we have an issue with the context. Like we don't know in what context it was written because it the for the original audience. So that is why, you know, for us, we kind of struggle with the with these kind of two options, um, you know, as far as uh, the, the interpretation and the application goes, right? So let's look at, um, you know, uh, if you look at the NIV, if you look into the notes, the text is there. 
if anyone is worried that he might not be acting honorably honorably towards the uh, virgin he is engaged to and if his passions are too strong and he feels that he ought to marry he should do as he wants he's not sinning they should get married but the man who has settled the matter in his own mind who is n- under no compulsion but has contra- control over his own will and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin this man also does the right thing so then he who marries the virgin does right but he who does not marry her does better okay then uh, the footnote has this about um, about the daughter you know the other scenario scenario b right if anyone thinks he's not treating his daughter properly but she is getting along in years uh, or if her passions are too strong and he feels she ought to marry uh, he should do as he wants he's not sinning he should let her get married right but the man who settled the matter uh, that who's under no compulsion and has control, control over his own will that made up his own mind to keep that you know his daughter unmarried this man also does the right thing so two scenarios for that particular context for the original audience right so that is something for us to consider like both these interpretations um both are valid so that's fine right verse 39 40 says um a wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives but if her husband dies she is at liberty to be married so uh you know final instruction or conclusion uh, that with with the death of either spouse comes the end of that covenant and and uh, and so you know the person is free to remarry right uh, someone else in the lord he, he he also specifies that which means a believer and uh, but he also says that a person will be happy if she remains as she is and she says this is my judgment not a command from the lord okay so with that um, he ends this whole topic on um, marriage uh giving away in marriage of a young person or you know if someone feels that they are uh they they need to be married because of a lack of self control or whatever you know all that is addressed addressed here uh in this chapter okay so we'll take a break we'll come back uh, to chapter 8